published a book called Reimagining the Research Process with Jürgen Sandberg from University of Queensland in Australia. So I will talk based on, on, on this one, which I am very happy with. I'm, I'm very happy with all my uh, books actually, but, uh, but this perhaps in, in particular. And <clears throat> there's that uh, read some of my stuff or, or listened to me before, they noticed that um, I'm a bit uh, concerned about the state of the art in organization management studies and social research in general. Enormous amount of work is being done and what comes out of all this is not necessarily always so impressive. So sometimes people are not only grumpy old men like myself, but also grumpy young men and grumpy um, middle-aged females and other categories, they or we complain a bit about um, the shortage of new ideas in the field, um, empirical work that is rather non or unimaginative and also a bit superficial. You send out the questionnaire, you uh, <clears throat> interview 40 people, question, answer, question, answer, then data processing of the outcomes of all that. Not necessarily particularly imaginative or interesting. And then the texts that we produce are not always that inspirational. Um, tend to be a bit formulaic, uh, rather boring perhaps. And, um, and uh, this one formulation of the, the state of art by two anthropologists. Um, they write that dissertation committees, uh, journal editors, uh, and others that tend to press a young school scholar to retain a pedantic, technical, academic storytelling style. One's personal identity and professional um, inclinations that tend to depend, uh, sorry, professional success tend to depend upon mastering this peculiar form of self-expression. So somehow we moved ourselves into a rather peculiar type of situation where, where pedantic, technical, seemingly objective, neutral, or the alienating type of doing research uh, tend to dominate. And this is seen as good or normal or the ideal or something that we all should learn and strive for. So, and there are very strong mainstreaming effects, and it's not only senior people behind all this, but young people also like to find uh, the formula, the recipe, and then uh, ah, try to learn that. Tell me how to do this so I will be successful. And then uh, they are often quite um, prepared or eager then to be disciplined, disciplined uh, normalized and mainstreamed. And then you continue that kind of, <clears throat> of, um, of development, uh, which is rather unfortunate for a variety of reasons, not necessarily for people wanting to have a simple and straightforward career, but for people that uh, think that social science should be interesting and engaging and produce a lot of text worth reading. So uh, we have the situation of a lot of imit imitations and isomorphism. Isomorphism means that you have some initial, initial variation, but then uh, things develop, so they assume a similar form. Organizations, for example, they tend to to mimic each other. And then after some time, you have a lot of organizations that look more, more or less the same, the same kind of structures and, and those types of positions and, and, and practices and so on. So uh, conformist is a very strong uh, tendency, including in, in, uh, in research, in our research. And there was one statement by, the previous editor of Academy of Management journal complained that all journals, journal articles, they look more or less the same. They are like black cats in a dark coal cellar who can't uh, differentiate them from each other. And of course, there's always some um, innovation, there's some <clears throat> 
originality in all text, but but often there is like 95% it's the same kind of structure and jargon and, and um, similar type of conclusions and setup and so on. <clears throat> and then you have a couple of percentages on the margin adding something relatively detailed. So Jorgen Sandberg and I, <clears throat> we want to <clears throat> challenge some of the dominance of, um, of this uh, conventions and then think how can we do think about do and report primarily qualitative research but research in general in social science particular organization management studies differently and the cry then for more imagination more creativity more pluralism i mean you've heard that before and it's easy to say uh, and then we should all be bold and we should support people with original ideas. We should uh, recruit and employ and promote people based on their unique contributions rather than just producing X number of similar looking papers in, in one and the same field. So it's easy to say all that, but we have actually tried to <coughs> work quite uh, hard in order to uh, facilitate such a change. So, um, and, and this series then that IBRAT has, has organized in particular, um, <clears throat> also aimed then to, to, to make a systematic and ambitious effort to push us in a hopefully better direction. Personally, I've written a large number of books and texts on how to be uh, <clears throat> facilitating a rigorous creative methodology. Reflexivity is one key uh, concept. And there are a lot of texts here, uh, books like Reflexive Methodology, Constructing Research Questions, Qualitative Research and Theory Development. And the latest, it's uh, called During Critical Research. It looks, looks like this. Uh, <clears throat> actually, second edition of an, an earlier book, but still a bit novel. And there are a lot of articles also published in in some of the leading journals. So even if the approach suggested here may be seen as outside mainstream, and it is outside mainstream, it's not necessarily perceived as particularly esoteric because these major, heavy, rather conservative and often boring journals, sorry, they tend to uh, also um, at least um, say that they want more stuff like this. And uh, some of our articles we published in Academy Management Review, for example. So there is some although, uh, um, ambivalent support for, for um, changes in our field. So uh, over to this, the, the present project on, um, uh, and the key idea here is to work with metaphors. Uh, and that's not necessarily so novel. We know that we work with metaphors already. Uh, but, but you can consider metaphors in different ways and work with this much more in terms of how do you consider your research process. Uh, and, and metaphors uh, sometimes are seen as linguistic devices. Uh, you, you use metaphors in order to beef up your text or your talk. So it's a rhetorical device. It's a way of communicating less, uh, less uh, in a less sterile way. So that's one meaning of metaphors. Poets are working very much with this. Another meaning, and that's what we are interested in here mainly, is metaphors in terms of the underlying image. Uh, the metaphors that we are relying upon when we think through what we are doing and we try to think about a particular issue. And here, of course, the linguistic devices, the explicit text that you're using uh, indicates the underlying image, but it's not necessarily the same. Um, sometimes there's a difference. Um, we, we use, of course, metaphors all the time when we produce text. And here is one um, uh, citation from a text, uh, widely cited, cited text by Roy Sadby. I think has been also performing in this uh, um, series of lectures here. Roy he writes about grounded theory, <clears throat> and then we just took a piece of text from his, his article, and I think it was AMJ. 
we he writes that the common misconception is that global theory requires a research uh, <clears throat> research to enter the field without any knowledge of prior research. There are several variants of this myth, each based on the false promise that research is a blank sheet, devoid of experience or knowledge, etc. Um, and if you look at the, this text, uh, <clears throat> Roy Sadeby is using a lot of metaphorical expressions, of course, grounded. It's like uh, soil out there or concrete that you are standing on. Blank sheet. Um, <clears throat> talks about uh, fresh insights. Um, rats, earlier travelers, war. So, um, uh, and the text is kind of nice to read, partly because of this uh, rich use of metaphors here. But the, the, <clears throat> the particular metaphors in the text, they don't tell us that much about uh, Roy Sadeby's image or, or ground metaphor, root metaphor, for how he considers research. I don't think that he think that we are in kind of vegetables uh, production here or, or sales like fresh or uh, <clears throat> blank sheet is, is it to, to uh, whatever blank sheet would indicate so so um, or that is traveler in terms of uh, around the globe in 80 days or something like that so the metaphors here there are um, expressions used in order to spice up the text and if you're interested in underlying metaphor the cognitive image that is working based on then we have to look uh, uh, beneath the lines, beneath the explicit, explicit vocabulary being used. Uh, <clears throat> but then if we take around the theory, his, his interest here, then we can notice that there are, these are metaphors. So, so discovery of grounded theory. Discovery here is a metaphor, I would say. It's not that you go out there and then you discover something like uh, you discover the source of the Nile or uh, or you discover um, the body of a missing person or something like that. Um, the, 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 <clears throat> the signifier here must be understood as, as, a, as a metaphor and also grounded. It, it's not kind of down on the ground in the sense that when you, you land your, your, your airplane or or stand steadily uh, after having a tour up there or something like that. So these are metaphorical expressions and, and then they can discuss whether <clears throat> a grounded, discovery of grounded theory is a good metaphor or not. But when we start to think about these issues, it's very important to consider these are metaphors. And with a metaphor, you get a particular framing and you can perhaps then start to consider alternative framings or images for how to think about this phenomenon and be more aware of advantages and disadvantages with a particular kind of vocabulary. So um, <clears throat> and one major problem as we see it is there is, is a tendency that we are using and overusing and being naive and uncritical and reflexive about um, uh, metaphors uh, related to that images that have been institutionalized, conventionalized, and we tend to take for granted. Uh, this was noted by Laurie Richardson, for example, in one handbook, uh, qualitative method handbook chapter, where she says that, writes that using old worn out metaphors, although easy and, and comfortable, after a while invites stodginess and stiffness. And that's my impression when I read through a lot of journal articles then that we are rather much into this unfortunate situation. And to repeat what I mentioned before, social science uh, studies, they need more good ideas and perhaps less on less focus on data management. Uh, Wikes, uh, expression here, disciplined imagination. It should be imaginative. Consider alternatives, and then you go through, through thought trials, and then you decide which of these makes most sense, and then you stick to them. That's, that's a good idea. 
uh, we have a lot of discipline, um, less of imagination, at least that's not particularly clearly demonstrated in texts and, and um, this not published texts. So, um, so we are interested in metaphors, partly because we see this as one uh, way of um, encouraging uh, imagination and, and creativity and, and also loosening up and get away from this uh, rather stodgy situation that we may be into. And as a lot of you know, we, we use metaphors uh, when we try to approach different type of phenomena in different research areas. So in organization studies, for example, uh, <clears throat> Gav Morgan wrote an article in ASQ 1980 and then a book, second edition, I think 97, The Images of Organizations is the letter called. And then he pointed a number of influential metaphors or images that we use when we, we think about organizations, for example, machines, organizations as machines, as organisms, political arenas, theaters, psychic prisons, cultures, brains, when you're interested in decision making and so on. So, and then uh, in, in leadership studies, then there are also efforts to try to uh, point at the metaphors that one uses in, in order to, to, to kind of grasp better what is leaders and leadership about. We had a book, Reflexive Leadership, published a couple of years ago, um, where we found the five P's of, of uh, leaders, then leaders understood as prophets, visions, etc. Pastors, values, ethics, good things, party host, creating spirit, uh, making people feel included, um, on board, committed, and so on. Psychotherapist, in emotional intelligence, support, understanding people, dealing with uh, their difficulties, stress management, or whatever, and pedagogues, learning, competence, general development, and so on. In consumer studies, Janis Gabriel has, and, and Tim Lang has written about uh, consumption and used uh, metaphors for the consumer, such as hedonists, rebels, victims, explorers, identity seekers, activists, higher education, uh, siege, incubator, temple, hub for society and sociology, machine, organism, ecology, system. jungle perhaps even if one is uh, a bit more cynical about human nature and human relations. Anyway, so what we are interested in is pushing this a bit further and, and look at not uh, how we approach our ob objects, our subject matters when we do research, but to use the idea of uh, the tendency to metaphorize things also in relationship to ourselves our communities, our roles, our, our work in the research process. And uh, we have like three meta metaphors for this. And that means that when, when we, we try then to have some kind of overall tactic or framework or idea of how do we use metaphors, then one can imagine different uh, options. I will still present uh, kind of like a cascade uh, of, of a spectrum of different metaphors, but, but you need also to structure this idea in some way. So we thought about different ways of approaching this. And one metaphor for the work with metaphors is the, the play of antipodes. We have a dialectical idea where um, here is a dominant metaphor for understanding something, and here is an alternative one, and then you create kind of dialectics or open up them for the negation, negation, and then for the, uh, the synthesis or, or, or getting further on then for, for opening up this space through stretching dominant idea and then a counter idea. And then you can see what you make out of that. That's more inspired by dialectics. Another being Swede, 
Swedish person uh, inspired by the day of the smorgasbord, which means that you have a variety of various dishes uh, that you can combine, but, but the variety should be well thought through. So there are certain things that should be on the table, not everything, but it should form a kind of whole. So you can make choices based on a well-picked combination of stuff. So you may have four or five, whatever metaphors that you feel comfortable and with, which you can choose between and combine in your research. And the third <clears throat> possible metaphor for this metaphorical approach that we are, are then suggesting is the idea of a super market, where there is really a cascade or proliferation of metaphors. So the more the better, that can be seen as perhaps confusing, but also facil facilitate creativity. So these are three kind of approaches to all this. And, and these are also metaphors, but these are meta metaphors. Metaphors for the metaphor work that we can be, be, be doing perhaps. And I hope you don't get headache now. No? No, <clears throat> at least some people are shaking their heads. Uh, so anyway, over to the, the kind of substance or the, the core elements of all this. So if you go through the research process and we thought, what are the ingredients, the elements, the stages, or the things that you need to think about, then <clears throat> you can point that um, uh, the overall point of research, I mean, what's the point of this, the thought of uh, increasing your empability, empability, you know what that is? No, empability means that you are E, employable, M, metricsable, particularly in UK, and then you are P, promotable. Then you have like empability, which is the DNA of the contemporary academic. Uh, a bit different from in the past, where people got their jobs and then they were doing teaching and they had a sabbatical every third year and then they thought about issues and then they went away, collaborated with people and wrote a book. These days are well gone. Now we're all into empability. Anyway, if we kind of bypass that slightly cynical or ironical remark, then we can think about what's the overall point of research? What's the meaning of this? Uh, apart from adding some nitty gritties to already overcrowded research field. What's the overall point? Why, why am I doing this? What's like the existential question? Uh, answer to that kind of question, etc. You can look more specifically at the researcher's role. How do you see yourself? What's your identity? What's your role? You can look at the research collective. Uh, that is probably uh, governing us in key respects. I mean, we all like to see ourselves as individual heroic characters that uh, do this based on our own choices and our fantastic uh, wish to develop knowledge and so on. But um, a lot of our thinking, our drivers, uh, our traject trajectories and destinies, they are governed by social collective forces. We all tend to be quite uh, tightly connected to various research collectives represented by journal editors, reviewers, associations, readers, whatever. Few people can break away from being part of the, the collective. Um, bad and good reasons. The research phenomena, what, how do we understand the research phenomena? Is something that exists out there, given that we study, or it's something that we more produce, construct? I think that good research tends to construct a research phenomena rather than to study something that is clearly there already. Uh, but that can be debated. The literature review, theory, design, method, data, collection and data analysis, writing and contribution. The other ways of dividing up what we, we tend to do, but these are some of the key 
elements. Uh, and some tend to be a bit more um, uphill and other more downhill in the process, but, but often it's kind of mixed a bit. So, uh, so you, you can think about the contribution already when you start doing the research, but you know more or less what to find. Add something marginally to institutional theory or, or say something about, more about uh, female entrepreneurs in a particular industry or whatever. So, but anyway, these are the elements. And then the idea that we have is that, okay, we look at all um, these elements and then identify what are dominant metaphors as uh, exhibited in the textbooks, method textbooks in, um, in research articles, and they tend to be the same. Um, <clears throat> what are the dominant metaphors? And in many cases, then these are presented as the self-evident meaning of something. So, so it's not opening up. We can see this in different ways. No, this is how it is, more or less. So um, the literature review, for example, not much variation in terms of how people approach this. Uh, <clears throat> etc. So, but we then looked at some more um, uh, deviating texts and, and um, also thought about, okay, if we consider everything that we have read and thought about over years, I mean, both Jürgen Sandberg and I, we have read quite a lot. And then think about alternative uh, metaphors. Not so popular, not so dominant, uh, a bit repressed, or, or so on. Okay, how can we perhaps add this to the picture and then show that here there is much more variation? And then also for showing this, encouraging people to think further about options and not be stuck in the dominant ways of thinking about all this. So in the book, then we have um, dominant metaphors, we have alternative metaphors, and then for people that want even more, we have some additional, these are a bit more esoteric, but, um, but still can be kind of creativity illuminating. So this is the, the basic idea. And then uh, the book gives, I think, quite a good overview of how we normally think about the research process and can then be used also for introducing PhD students, undergraduate students, even perhaps more master students to how can we do research if we're more conventional, but also to think about these things in a bit more, yeah. Uh, perhaps an orthodox way. So uh, um, it's, it's not so easy to come up with a good kind of combination of different metaphors, but still. Now there are a lot of people have something in the chat here, but I guess it's more hello and uh, so on. Yeah, there are some sure. questions in the chat. Um, some some have already posted some of their questions. Um, would you like to uh, pose your question directly to Matt? Just unmute yourself. Yeah, if we can take one or two questions yeah. now, so so you don't have to hear my voice all the time, uh, and then I continue because this is about uh, <clears throat> half the lecture or so, and then, then I continue and explain more specifically how can yeah. work with this. But one or two questions, I think that's fine. But but only a couple because otherwise it's easy that um, you miss the second half of the the talk here. Yeah. Yeah. We can take two questions. Uh, Rahman has unmuted himself, so you can go ahead. Uh, first of all, uh, I really can't believe I'm, meet, I'm seeing my hero, somebody who I grew up reading right from a PhD student, and uh, it's, I just I'm so happy, right? And uh, I, I, I'm, uh, the question that is arising is the use of metaphor and emotion and real ethnographic research is very valued, and it kind of... Uh, 
tells you about a place and the causal dynamics of an organizational phenomenon uh, in that place. But what happens is that in the journal world where one, if one know, knowing the context, um, such an attempt to give you that uh, bring metaphor raw narrative is often uh, you get uh, you get a desk reject and they say that it's not a theoretical contribution. How do you reconcile these uh, these two things of um, bringing metaphor and bringing alive the field, but also saying that you have to make that theoretical contribution, which in really may not be uh, the X one the the may be a, the on the n plus one way of putting Foucault in uh, in a new in in a new garb. Yeah, no, thanks, Raman. I, I think that I mean the, the general tricky things is that uh, for most journals, ninety percent of the con of the, the submissions they are rejected. So, so it, it's very difficult to to get published. We have everybody likes to get published, and then space is limited, and it's difficult to say something new. Uh, so, so that's the dilemma, and and um, I, I think there's a tendency that that journalists they like to have this sometimes rather sterile theoretical contribution, adding something abstract to, to uh, research uh, tradition. I think that's a bit counterproductive, and that very rich and interesting empirical studies should be upgraded. Having said that, I do think that. Um, some clear takeaway is needed and that could be an idea or, or some good critique or some uh, in, interesting pointing at something um, non non-expected or unfamiliar in a particular site so we always need to work uh, work hard here in order to do that i do think that the general idea here with metaphorization is that you open up then for um, for the creative part of research, and, and 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 if you do that, it's easier to soon or late to get that kind of here is the idea, here is something unexpected, because you place yourself in a different mood than what is common, and and it's easier then to um, to to see something a bit different than what others are doing. But this is a tricky part in all research, of course. Thank you very much, Mats. I think we have Nicole Thank next in line, so you can go ahead and unmute yourself. Hi, everybody. My name is Nicole, and I'm a first year PhD student at Ryerson. I have a question for you, um, and it's essentially, how do you reconcile the fact that we need new metaphors and better or creative ideas, and the new PhD student who still has to get their PhD dissertation? Where is there space for creativity for somebody earlier in their career as opposed to um, maybe later in their career? Well, this is uh, uh, one of the standard questions that they all always uh, always get, and, and I don't think that's um, it's harder and, and easier than to get the new ideas when you are a newcomer. I mean, if you've been into a field a very long time, then you tend to be a stupid and, and square-minded and, and conventionalized as everybody else, unless you are really curious and you read quite a lot and you are prepared to, to, to move fields uh, by and then. Um, I do think it's, it's always a dilemma for a newcomer. You need to have support. Uh, you need to learn from, from your supervisor and other people, but then you often end up being rather compliant and, and, um, and, and then just mimicking. This is the way to do it. You do it in the same way. So, so I think that trying to, to master this dilemma between being a clone or following somebody in the footsteps and try to find your own way. But uh, to read a bit more broadly, talk to different types of people, read not only the standardized literature within a particular uh, research box, but, but try to by and then um, not be all over the place, but make moves outside your core domain. I think that's one. And, and also talk to other people, cultivate networks. Um, be a guest PhD student in some places, but make sure that you are not just confined in a limited space, easily meaning that you are become um, very much tied to your supervisor's approach and then just mimic that. I mean, we For can't sure. be too independent sometimes, but I do think that that's always a dilemma. For sure. Thank you so much. Thank you.
All right, so I continue and then we can come back with, with questions and comments a bit later, if that's okay with, with you. Yes, of course. Yeah, good. So I, I, I will talk about a few of these um, metaphors in some depth, so you understand what this may mean. And it's a little bit of a search collective, design, data, and, and the writing. So uh, if we take the research collective, and this is something uh, like Nicole's question, uh, kind of hint, hint to that, so it's a bit relevant here. But normally we don't think that much about the research collective. Well, there are people there, we have a research society, a research community, but how can we think about this? Um, and then there are some dominant understandings that, that often pops up in conversations, in literature, in, in method writings and so on. And one is that it's a community. We belong to the community and you go to conferences with associations and everybody is, pretends to be very friendly and supportive and blah, 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 which is fine. And that captures one meaning of the research collective. It's a large community full of supportive, helpful people giving you a sense of belongingness and so on. That's one meaning. An alternative meaning, this is like a conversation. So research collective, they give you space there for conversations. Some conversations are perhaps rather boring, repetitive. Some are very interesting. Some goes on forever. And then we can see ourselves as like participating in the conversation. So who am I talking to? Uh, what do I add? Should I continue this conversation? Is this the right one or the Is it just me or did Matt freeze? Yes, it, it, it's everybody. It is yes, not just yes, you. Yes, he froze. Yes, yes. We just give him a moment. Was there a question or a comment or something that I need to defend myself against? Or no, I think um, Made will ask his question later during the Q and A. Okay, that's good. So the research collective, and then. Um, like the field we're into, how people are positioned and what are the kind of groups and, and so on. Uh, you can see this is a trade association. So you belong to a particular area, uh, a particular view on, on, on leadership, for example, or something. And then you, you form a coalition or a trade association with others and you're eager to promote this. So there should be special issues, you should have streams at conferences, you push for how important this is in relationship to other areas. Or you are into a marketplace where there is very harsh competition, where we all compete with each other for, for status, for positions, for research grants, um, for citations, for, for, for everything. So, so that academia is like a jungle or at least perhaps a more civilized type of marketplace, but this is not like a big, great community necessarily. Underneath there is this marketplace. So these are some of the dominant metaphors, but there may also alternative ones that we may miss, perhaps see our own research collectives as rather primitive in some ways as, as tribes. Uh, relatively close, not particularly welcoming, uh, uh, circling around our key concepts, uh, our own symbolism, and, 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 um, uh, and being rather primitive. And then we address other people within our, our relatively closed systems, other people sharing our, our detailed interest in, in adding to institutional theory or, or, or the understanding of teams or trust or whatever. Sometimes we can see this as chain gangs. You have like collaborations and then you are like in a chain gang tied to other people. You have to move, but you, you need to do that in a synchronized way. So you have very much limited space. Sometimes the research collective can, uh, can move more into like a lynch mob uh, mood. 
So I, um, I wrote a critical review of institutional theory with some people, and then uh, I thought it was quite well uh, thought through and argued, etc. But uh, reviewers, they were very eager to ditch this. And then finally, we got it published and through bypassing the review process. And this was like an editor's choice for one journal. And then there were three commentators, uh, and through two at least, were very upset about this. This is ridiculous, and we can't mean that. We suggested it should have a moratorium on the word, word institutional, because that means absolutely everything, and nobody has any clue what it means. So perhaps we should not use the term and then try to explain what are we actually after instead. But that was not particularly top, popular, so, so, so uh, people then became rather angry and frustrated and so on. So sometimes you have this type of, of um, approach. Sometimes we can just think about ourselves as being our, in our small boxes. We live in a box where similar-minded people believe that we are doing some important thing. This is really significant and we really should pr make progress and make contributions and so on. Outside the box, mm, not necessarily, but we are kind of caught here in our small, small microspace. So the idea here is that we start to think about the research collective. Uh, and don't think that I'm like a free spirit here and I'm doing what I want and so on, but, but realize that we are very much part of a collective. And how do we relate to that? Can we be a bit more rebe rebellious? Should we kind of just float, be part of this, maximize the community or, or um, support from other people? Or how do we relate to this? That is one key element. And then we think through uh, this, then there are many different options. You can say that, okay, I'm an independent spirit. I don't want to go for a po uh, to win popularity contests, etc. I realize that I need to manage the collective in a particular way. Not too much um, negative feeling, not too much uh, hostility. But I don't necessarily have to go to the same bloody conference or be friendly to the same type of people or refer to these people all the time or whatever. I can try to find another route. That's one way of doing this. And that, of course, that you are very much there, you cultivate your relations, you are uh, doing uh, service for associations. You, you, you build relations and you're very much the core of this social structure. And then you see that you have certain benefits, but of course with that you have a lot of constraints as well. So being at the core of a research collective, that means that you give up some of your intellectual freedom, of course. So, so if we think through this, that then there's an avenue of options uh, then for how to relate to things a bit differently than we perhaps do if we are caught in certain images or metaphors for, um, for uh, the research collective. But this is just one element providing heavy input to our work. Another is the literature review. And as I mentioned before, I just take a number of examples of the research process where we can highlight dominant meanings through metaphors and then we think about alternatives. One is then the literature review. And of course, the literature review is only one way of conceptualizing how we relate to earlier work in a particular field or even outside that, that kind of field. Uh, and the dominant understanding is that you review all the literature. Perhaps you look at the major journals and see what have they written about something and then you through this, try to summarize the kind of stuff and then see what you can add, learn from that and what you can add and relate to this in different ways. So, uh, and the dominant view on all this seems to be one of knowledge packaging. So there is a lot of 
books and papers and, and so on out there. And then you are supposed to in three pages, then you package all this. Uh, and then you have a knowledge package and then you can uh, relate to that and then see what you can add to that particular package of knowledge being there easily summarized on that three pages. Or you can see uh, this is not easily packaged, but more like a jigsaw puzzle. There are complications and difficulties and make, make it all together. You can use the, the metaphor of gap spotting. You look at all the literature and, and then you find a gap ah, here. Even if there are um, a lot of uh, studies on female uh, entrepreneurs in the restaurant industry in Michigan, for example, there are uh, none of queer female entrepreneurs in the restaurant industry in Michigan. And then you find the option, then there's a gap in the literature, and then, then you contribute with that knowledge contribution. Or you can see this is very much a construction project. So you somehow can just, not just package or spot a gap or something. You need to construct the literature in a particular way, do something with it. So, so, so it appears to be reasonable what you are doing. And, and then you, you can claim a contribution based on how you exactly have structured or constructed all this. So these are some of the dominant metaphors. Uh, I'm not so fond of any of this. I, I think that they tend to be, be limiting your imagination and, and people do uh, that, that work based on this kind of metaphors too frequently. So some alternative understandings here could be to consider um, uh, the literature view as a site for fault finding. That is how I approach normally a field. I look at what have they done here, and then um, uh, I assume that they probably got some things wrong. Not everything, but uh, there are some mistakes. There are some things that people tend to take for granted or, or, or approach in a problematic way. So I, I assume that they've got it wrong. And then I find the faults, and then you get an idea to do this in a different way. You don't look for the, the kind of truths or the insights or the contributions. These are what people already typically have on their minds. You look for what is kind of missed, the stupidities. You can see the literature view also as a, as a blinker that if you read too much in a particular field, then you become a bit stupid because you take on board all the concepts, all the perspectives, all the truths and conventions that people in a particular research area um, uh, has already kind of agreed upon and tend to reproduce. So uh, reading too much, doing a really proper literature review, reading like 50, 60 um, leading academic journal art articles from leading academic journals, and then you know the field, yeah, perhaps, but you probably have become a bit um, square-minded in this process because you have encountered too much of the same, more or less. There's always some variation, but the variation may be quite limited. So it's variation within what people that uh, have been uh, able to publish in these journals tend to agree upon and, and the rest of the stuff they have just filtered away. Or you can see the literature more as a, as a dialogue partner. You try to ask questions back and forth, so you're a bit more skeptical. You try to have a distance. You ask questions to the literature, and the literature responds back, and so on. So a dialogue partner is a bit different in terms of a metaphor from reading this as, as a blinker, or you do this as a fault finder. There's always some overlap between a lot of the metaphors force, but they still give you some, some different types of ideas and understandings and so on. Or you can look at the literature to, to spot assumptions. This is the literature review can be seen as not something that you read in order to get their specific knowledge contributions, but you can read that in order to understand what are the assumptions, taking for granted assumptions, 
paradigmatic drivers behind what people are then on an explicit level uh, referring to and, and, and talking about and so on. So you, you see then the literature review as is more um, an exercise in assumption digger. We've written about this that interesting research. Then you identify, you, you articulate, and you challenge assumptions in literature. This is, of course, very different then from the conventional and dominant metaphors for the literature. And then you have access to a number of different uh, metaphors, and then you can approach the literature in the field in very different ways. You still have to read part of the literature. Of course, if you're into assumption dig digging, then you read much more thoroughly and fewer texts. If you're into knowledge packing, then, then you can read the summaries and then dunk, 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 dunk here, like three packages. And now I relate to one of these or a combination of these or whatever. So, so there are different ways of reading and relating to literature. And the literature you know, could be um, a goal mine for coming up with something new, but often this is seen as something that you kind of need to tick off and then effectively summarize the stuff on around three pages. Not necessarily a scholarly idea, but a conventional and dominant idea. So, um, um, yeah, now I, I just mentioned the other elements here and then we can have questions and comments and so on. So design, design is another uh, stage or element or part of the research process. And here dominant metaphors may be blueprint. You have a clear design and then you follow design. Uh, and then that is supposed to lead to uh, research results. You see the design is more like a, a composition. It's not so structured, not so predictable. It's not so governing, but you have a composition. I will do 20 interviews with these people and then 10 with others. Uh, look at, at uh, this, try to make some observations or whatever, and then you have a composition here of stuff that you work with. You can see the design more as, as a legitimizing account. Whatever we are doing out there, when we do empirical research, it's often qualitative research at least, quite messy, unpredictable, not so ordered, rather confusing. But the method section, the design, it's more like an account that rationalizes or legitimizing what you have done. It's not pure fake, but it's not an uh, accurate mirroring of exactly what you thought and what you were doing either. Well, you can see the design is very much about pattern following. Go out there and you find a pattern, preliminary pattern, and then you continue to do that in order to make sure that you have found the pattern. Assuming, of course, that there is a pattern out there and this pattern is to be found and reported. That's another day of design. Alternatives to all this could be that you, you see uh, what you're doing as, as producing a story, there's a plot, uh, there are characters, there is a problem, there are um, some development, etc. And then the design is more like uh, plotting the plot. Or you can see design more like a journey. Of course, the journey always has some direction, but it's not necessarily so predictable. It's not like a commuter journey. It's more something slightly more adventurous, uh, not so uh, predictable. But you start to go out there, you see what's happening with these uh, people in this particular organization, and then see what are they up to. You kind of follow them, and then you, you notice that it would be interesting to, to uh, perhaps uh, be more interested in a particular issue or a conflict or a drama or whatever, and then the sign is more like a journey. Plan then rather roughly and, and with a lot of flexibilities. So you can see uh, the sign as a beach combing. Janice Gabriel has written about this. He says that you can see uh, research is very much beach combing. 
you go out there on the beach and then you see there's a lot of kind of crap and, and uh, uninteresting things being there, but sometimes you see a piece of wood that is, is uh, very interesting shape. You imagine I could perhaps do something with this in my house. Uh, use this for manufacturing something or put it on the wall or whatever. And uh, here you see a shell, nice shape, or kids could perhaps play around with this. I can see certain possibilities and so on. So when you do beach combing, then people could work. You encounter a lot of things that you find totally uninteresting. This is not relevant, it doesn't tell you anything, but there's some stuff that you work could work creatively creatively with, and then you focus on that. So that's an alternative design. It means that 90% of all empirical material you encounter, you probably just disregard because this is trivial. Just to repeat what everybody knows, uh, superficial answers on interviews, uh, meetings where nothing really is happening and so on. Skip that and go for the more cre creative. Uh, or creativity stimulating encounters in your shelf work. You need to be careful about cherry picking, of course, but you can say that now I started this event with certain things that are being uh, manifest. I'm not generalizing for me, so I'm just saying that this encounter may make it possible for us to learn something more and come up with a new concept or whatever. Or you can work with mystery creation. That's one of my favorite ideas. So you go out there and you encounter something that is quite unexpected, difficult to explain. Existing knowledge uh, let you down. So good research is based on two elements. You A, create a mystery or you stumble on one. And then you solve the mystery through new interpretations, new concepts, new theoretical understanding or revision of the theoretical understanding, and then you have a contribution. So this is one possible design idea that you go out there, you find and solve a mystery. You need to hang may need to hang around a bit in order to uh, to uh, find or creatively construct or whatever the mystery but sooner or later there is probably one there with some potential or that that's my experience that all the time when you do a good proper empirical study there is a potential mystery i mean life is full of mysteries And uh, oops, and I talked too long already here. So let's move on a bit more quickly. Data collection. Um, dominant ideas are that data is about building blocks or uh, referee. We have an hypothesis, an idea, and then we go to data, and data says no or yes, and then you can continue with your work. Or data can be seen as road signs that point you uh, in the right direction. Uh, Alternative ones is data is more like rhetorical tropes. We use data as rhetorical resources. We can see them as clues, always unreliable, uh, but, but still giving us some hints. And then we need to sort out the, what of all the data give uh, us reliable clues and how can we combine them in order to say something about whatever if the the manager is authentic or, or um, how decision making really took place or, um, or whatever, if they're serious, we see this all, what they were interested in. Or data can be seen as always about impression management. People are into impression management and data providers also. So um, we jump over this contribution. What is the contribution? There are some dominant metaphors, expansion of the literature, uh, extend the literature. That seems to be a very uh, co common contribution. If you have the literature, it's like him, and then you extend the literature. very common metaphor for, for the research uh, in terms of contribution or it's like brick laying, you build uh, knowledge bricks and then we have a large knowledge temple or library and any new study act, uh, adds to this through the kind of bricks. Uh, 
that we as, as humble and diligent uh, knowledge uh, construction workers are into. And the more knowledge bricks that we have put in place, the more we know. Um, or supermarkets adding the means that we add new concepts, new ideas, varieties, and so on. We are not building like this. Supermarket adding approach means that we add something in terms of, of uh, additional stuff rather than building like this. Alternative contributions could be that we generate an idea. We produce a rich story. An ethnographic story, perhaps, that is very kind of rich and insightful and interesting to read. A contribution can be a disruption. We end a conversation. Uh, after 10, 15, 20 years, 30 years of identity studies, and I worked a lot with identity studies, I sometimes think that we will not get another study. Uh, perhaps so, so a contribution could be to kind of stop things from going on for, forever or we can find a good uh, solution to uh, a mystery perhaps. So these are examples how we can metaphorically think about contributions in different ways than are common. So the guidelines for metaphor work, identify the current taking for granted metaphors in use. That's one element and not be kind of caught by them, not be victims of the kind of dead metaphors that are there. A dead metaphor is a metaphor not recognized as a metaphor. We need to codify material. We need to have a design. These are examples of, of dead metaphors. We build theory. Uh, we don't think about this as metaphors. The metaphors, they have kind of uh, put themselves in our heads. Um, and then we don't have this more flexible, reflexive approach to all this. A metaphor we should be able to think much more kind of flexibly about. So uh, we kind of liberate ourselves from the dead, taking for granted metaphors, and then we identify a set of useful metaphors. These three or four metaphors, they may work for me, giving some variation. And then we can work with an operative strategy or tactic for metaphorizing a specific part of the research project. So when I think about um, my research role, okay, this is how I normally think about myself. Okay, are there a couple of alternative meanings for my identity or role? Or when I think about writing, what is the text for me? This is writing up the research, effective communication of research results. That's one approach. Another is that you write a story, for example, or you try to provoke and engage and upset make the reader think differently or provocateur. These are examples that you use, a few metaphors, and then you can think about this where you write, for example, and then see how oh, here I can do something different than the conventional route. So and then metaphorical reflexivity, that's, that's a concept one can, can bring with you. So you reflect on your metaphors, you challenge them, and then you make informed choices when you do things, different things in the research process. So conclusion, um, it's important to think through what we take for granted and we are caught by, and, and this is part of the liberation project, uh, where we can liberate uh, ourselves, and perhaps other from being too prematurely normalized, standardized, caught in the templates. Um, and here, one way of all doing this is then to consider metaphors or spectrum of different metaphors, whether conventional, alternative, and perhaps even one or two odd metaphors in all this. And the idea is that if we do that, then there will be much easier to be creative in idea generation, in empirical work, and then the production of texts. This should hopefully may make uh, research and life less dry, boring, alienating, and predictable. Perhaps less comfortable as well. But I mean, some risk and some humor and some uh, other ingredients in, in research life is not necessarily to be avoided. Um, 
but we also need, and here's the word, word of caution, we should also be aware of not being too kind of wild-eyed or too enthusiastic or uh, ex embarrassingly experimental. So sometimes people say, now I will do something that is really creative and really original and really me. Um, and, uh, and so on, that can lead to some uh, less uh, fortunate outcomes. So, so all this here, uh, what I kind of pitched here, doesn't mean that we shouldn't be quite careful, cautious, rigorous uh, in what we are doing, but we can do that and also be creative and imaginative. So um, try work a bit different. Uh, but also be slightly careful out there. Sorry, now I talked a bit too long here, but uh, we open space that I guess for. Thank you so much for such an insightful and great talk and a box breaking, you know, approach to research that we really need as early career researchers because we're so bound to the existing, you know, ways of conducting research and reviewers and all that process. Um, I want to open the floor now for questions. I know that we have a couple of questions in the chat, but I want to encourage those who posted their questions in the chat to post them directly to Matt. And uh, for those who may be shy, I can also, you know, just read out your questions. Um, but I want to give a chance to those who didn't, you know, uh, ask their questions to ask their questions first. I do have questions myself, but I want to ask them at the end. So, Sijun, I can see that your hand is up. You can unmute yourself. Yeah, thank you very much, Matt, for your very uh, insightful and like, refreshing presentation. And my name is Sijun, who recently graduated from University of Arizona. I have a, a very specific question about uh, about a very specific type of metaphor, which is like personification or anthropomorphism. And on the one hand, yeah, I think that we all do this all the time where we like try to like think about like organization as a something like human-like thing. And like we like treat organization as a decision maker and like we make, a, make some analogy about that. Uh, but on the other hand, we are often told that, hey, they do not treat like non-human being as a human being. And I think it is really difficult to make some balance between those two. So my question is that when would be appropriate like treat organization as a human being and when it would be uh, uh, problematic, like potentially like involving like the ecological fallacy like thinking. Yeah, no, I, I think it's very tricky to, to say something um, um, general about this. I mean, we, we all, all, all know this by and then. And sometimes it makes sense. I mean, something the organization decided to do. It's a bit easier than to say that perhaps than uh, include all the people that were, were involved in that particular decision. So, um, so sometimes people can use... Uh, personalization as, as a shortcut uh, in order to capture something that when people understand that this is a metaphor. The problem is sometimes when people confuse it and, and uh, with, with reality and, and don't understand this. So I think that we can do quite a lot if we are aware of this. And then we also remind the audience that this is actually a metaphorical expression and, and this simplifies things a bit too much but perhaps uh, it, it also is convenient in order to, to drive the, the point through without too much complication so um, but with all metaphors we, we should just think uh, does it make sense here is it productive is it uh, are we and others aware that this is a metaphor often the problem is that we confuse dead uh, metaphors with reality, we take, take them for granted. And then uh, we, we, we make mistakes or we contribute to, to bad thinking of people. Thank you. Thank you very much, Matt. Samar, I can see your hand is up so you can unmute yourself. Thank you very much, Nazha. Um, thank you very much, uh, Professor Matt. It's, uh, it's, it's mind blowing. Um, still in the thoughts uh, there. Uh, I wanted to ask about metaphors which are very language bound and 
culturally ingrained. So, and I do, when, when I pose this question in the comment, I, I had a, some response, which is very logical that we should not, we might not think it as a limitation. <laughs> but if it's a limitation, how to overcome that? Should we, should we think it as a limitation? And if that is, then somehow it does bound us. So how to overcome that considering uh, when we say our research needs to be internationally recognized, you know, it needs to be four star where it's globally recognized. Thank you. Yeah, no, I think that that is tricky. So sometimes um, good handling of metaphors, it calls for some extra feeling for language. Uh, and here the elements such as you yourself as an author. Can, can, can you write this in such a way so that the, the possible new, I mean, it's not always something that's called for a lot of nuances, but sometimes you need to express this in such a way so that people get the idea uh, in the way that you imagine. And then you need to, to, to recognize your, your and know your audience also a bit. So, so sometimes when we are writing in a foreign language, and I do that myself, I'm from Sweden, so I'm a bit clumsy. I feel my IQ is going down by 10 points when I, I talk and write in, in, in English. Um, it, it is a bit more tricky to, to um, get the message through, but, but on the whole, I mean, we can't avoid using met metaphors. They're always there. And, and if we work in another language, then we still need to, to struggle with how to get language um, kind of correct or as persuasive or as interesting or as, as communicative as possible. And they are thinking through the metaphors is, is, is one uh, important element. Sometimes there's a problem that we use metaphors um, from fields that we have little knowledge about and that could be an other complication but that's more like lack of knowledge about something than perhaps um, struggling with with the nuances around language but like I said it we, we are like language workers and, and we, we need to, to really work with texts and, and consider how we frame our messages and get through and also consider the responses of the audiences. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mats. I know Made had unmuted himself a while ago and he just posted his question. Would you like to pose it directly to Mats? Made? Yeah. Oh, hi. Yes. Um, um, can you hear me? Um, yeah. my, my question is a little bit like what I think uh, Ben Agar has said in his book about public sociology in the way that social science nowadays is moving or molded by the fact that we want to be taken seriously. So we want to model ourselves on uh, pure science, like, you know, medical research, proving causality as it is, while, you know, with such creative lenses that we are using, how do we ensure the rigor of, of our analysis? Yeah, I think that there are different types of ideas around rigor. So some of the metaphors that I'm proposing, like research as uh, detective work or um, as storytelling or, or uh, mystery creation and, and um, mystery solving, which is similar then to detective work, I guess. They, they, they also call for rigor. So, so you need to um, carefully think through your case, your text, etc and uh, make sure that this is um, holds water uh, not necessarily in the same way as, as quantitative work but but still uh, you need to be quite careful and persuasive in terms of what you're doing but then the key point of, of a lot of qualitative research and what i'm mainly interested in is not necessarily to to um, make uh, make a waterproof case for something that most people find this is really absolutely believable i do think that in social science our contributions are so much adding to 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 um to thinking to reflection to help people to think a bit smarter about issues um, and here uh, there are different criteria for what is a good knowledge contribution. 
I came up with Andre Spice a concept functional stupidity a number of year, years ago and we talked about this in this Debrat lecture series um, as well and uh, that that kind of book and the concept has been extremely influential in Sweden it was incorporated into Swedish um, uh, official language functional stupidity and, and almost every day I get uh, I get mails or comments from people in the public that have heard about this or read stuff or have examples of this so, so this has been extremely influential and a lot of people feel this is really relevant I don't think that any people doing rigorous quantitative work in Sweden at least has come near this in terms of having an impact so, so we can be influential in different ways and one way of doing this is being more imaginative, uh, writing studies that uh, are more appealing and interesting for people to read, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So um, I think we should respect different types of doing research, um, uh, but also realize that social science is quite different than from uh, the other science, the true or natural or whatever sciences. Uh, and and then optimize what we can do in terms of doing good work that uh, make contributions. Thank, Thank you, you very much, you Mats. Very much. Ignaz, you're next in line. Uh, yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks, Mats, for uh, the very interesting presentation. And um, I think you showed very nicely how, on the one hand, or um, the metaphors we use stem from our life world and on the other hand shape or perception of the life world and connecting to to samar's question i'm wondering i mean to what extent is this not kind of like is the metaphor itself um very much contributing to a divide and to kind of a colonial um divide among academics where all the big journals are uh, coming from the anglo-saxon world so that the metaphors used stem from a life world of the global north and people from the global south having a different life world either have would use other metaphors that editors and reviewers would say i don't get this so reject and um like being aware of this what are your thoughts on what are possibilities to overcome this because we we won't do it without metaphors anyway so we have to approach this somehow yeah, no, I, I think it's a very good point that uh, I mean, existing vocabulary models, um, everything, including metaphors, they are, um, are ne never can just neutral or just positive resources for making us think. They are that as well, but they also make us a bit kind of stupid and, and often they are... Um, impregnated by political interests and so on. So if we talk about leadership and strategy, for example, that tend to, to favor then, of course, certain elite groups that are doing kind of good job and, and we should respect them and so on. But it's not obvious that when we call what administrators or managers do leadership, that this is not uh, an outcome of um, American, North American uh, colonial domination. I mean, I'm not saying that this is the case, but that's food for thought. And uh, one idea with all this uh, stuff that we're doing is then to try to be a bit more careful uh, how we can uh, critically examine our doings and our thinkings and our contributions. And, and here, one key element is probably saying that where are these coming from and what, what kind of interest and cultural forms of domination are infiltrating all this. I mean, a lot of management studies, it comes from um, United States and, and the time period when uh, generals, uh, field marshals, they were very uh, popular after the Second World War. And of course, this frames a lot of stuff that we are doing for sometimes not in a particular positive way. So that, that's a good point. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much, Matt. Celeste, you're next. Oh. Yes, hello, uh, Mats. Hello. Yes, I share very much your analysis of um, uh, the social sciences. If you can, uh, if you speak uh, or management or organizational sciences in general, uh, when I think about solutions or uh, 
possibilities uh, for researchers. I tend to think, um, based on the analysis, shared analysis, tend to think more of engaged scholarship in the sense of action research, social constructivist type of uh, large scale um, projects where more knowledge and more substantial knowledge comes out due to action research. Uh, that is working with a sample of people who tend to be disadvantaged or deserve attention, uh, extra attention, uh, and ensure that uh, replicability is uh, a norm to upheld. So that, that, that it's really uh, replicable and therefore uh, scientific, even though not objective, because we've, we've helped these people in a particular situation, uh, but we could uh, retrace uh, if we are careful and rigorous in the way we document uh, what we are doing every step of the way and involve the uh, uh, subject involved in the field, then I would think that social scientists and organizational, and organizational uh, uh, scholars could potentially, but also social scientists, uh, could potentially add more value or at least more diversity and then there is the positivistic police, if I may say so, uh, that is often, and the incentive structures of, the, of most universities and business schools, that is flagging that down. What do you think about this uh, situation? If you yeah, should. no, nice to see you again, Celeste. Uh, um, uh, no, I, I probably agree. Um, I do think that we have a problem of, of being kind of useful. I mean, why should all the taxpayers, uh, some countries, students pay this enormous amount of money for social scientists, in most cases, writing reports and texts that very few people really read or make uh, not much of a difference. I got a mail from one uh, student uh, then asking what would happen if all the sociology department in the world would uh, be bombed and just disappear. Well, would anybody notice? Um, perhaps not, I don't know, but 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 I mean, it's a problem and then we can be, be useful, I think, in two ways. One is then through uh, being public intellectuals or saying something that is, is read or considered more broadly and then add something to, to thinking and so on. And the other is then through, through a bit more specific, useful, um, activities where there is a problem and we, we, we can develop knowledge that is relevant for a particular group. Um, I agree that we, we need to think in both, or at least I think that we need to, to consider both, both these two options. Um, I must confess that we wrote this book, we had then uh, the, the more uh, conventional idea of broader knowledge contributions, uh, aiming them for journals or something like that in mind. But I do think that when you consider a specific situation like action research or working with people that uh, have fewer resources, or I mean, I think there's a difference if you work with elites, corporate elites, and then uh, you have issues around power dynamics in a particular way. Uh, and, and you easily becomes a bit corrupted or brought into their powerful universe, which is quite different than if you do research that are more for for, for people that, that that perhaps would benefit from social support and so on. So here I think that I could consider that and, and, and then come up with, okay, what are the images, what are the understandings of doing research? that are more attuned to these particular situations and the research collectives, the research identities, the way we write, uh, relate to early existing knowledge and so on. So, so I think it could be very interesting to, 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 to look at this more in depth. But I must confess that we have this like more average situation of, of, of how to write for journal articles or produce a research book for a broader, non-differentiated audience in mind. Thank you. Thank you very much, Matt. I think we have the time for two more questions. I see Victor, you have your hand up. You can go ahead, unmute yourself. Yes, thank you. Uh, I would like to connect to the previous three uh, people who spoke. And I think that it is all kind of going back to what uh, 
mate was saying about that we want to become taken seriously as as social science and so on and therefore we try to model ourselves after the so-called natural sciences uh, I, obviously the word natural social distinction is is very very unnatural but uh, the problem is that if we try to model ourselves after physicists it is not true that we are modeling ourselves after physicists we are trying to model ourselves after what we know about physics which is very little i have conducted a series of interviews with nobel prize winning scientists and i can tell you that physicists don't think like we think physicists think so many of them are not positivists at all they talk all the time about emergence they use their intuition and they are far softer than what how we represent them so i think it is it is a kind of a wake up call in that sense but i also have to say that uh, there are a few people who managed to Publish extensively. Obviously, Matz is, is the main one, but here is Yehuda. We talked, the Celeste was just talking, and so on. So, there are many people who managed to publish already many things on this softer side. But we also need to tell those who are very early doctoral students and very early career researchers that it also has the price. So, for example, I was very provocative when I was talking about the Nobel laureates. It took me 10 years to get the paper out, 10 years in review. And at the end, I had to give up because I ran out of four star journals and I published it in a three star journal. It was a it is a very good journal. It is management learning, but it was the process. And I mean, the number of frustrations over the 10 years, that was harsh. But this is why I think that it is incredibly great that you are talking about all the metaphors and so on and the different types of research. I particularly like the mystery creation as it is it is how i look at my stuff and it it works very well but i think that you also need to warn the the students that if they are uh, particularly creative on the methodological side it might not be trivial to publish it will be the more valuable if they manage to do it but do you have any strategy on this that math so what to what to put where and how how you balance this that you you get published in top journals and you do all the all the non-positivistic stuff too so yeah no i, I don't know I, th I think that all people they, they face problems and, and uh, it's possible that with um i mean that, that to one reason why people are rejected is that there's nothing novel here. I think that still it's yes. the most common reason. It's it's not seen as, as a clear contribution, and then it's not perhaps done in a credible way. I I do think that that the major hurdle is, is still then then there's nothing new here. So so, so I, I mean I, I do a lot of reviews, and then I tend to be very harsh reviewer because I I, I don't see that much new here. This is another uh, yeah. black cat in the, the coal cellar, so so that's risk thing to 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 of course be, be try to be very innovative and unconventional and so on. But it's also very risky to be very conventional. Yes, <laughs> because you don't have anything new to say. So so. Um, so I don't know, but but uh, I do think that work. I mean, all my books and 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 writings they try to be helpful in terms of pro providing methodological support for for being reasonably rigorous and having vocabulary for articulating things that are a bit differently done. Uh, and then I do think that still it's possible to do this and and. Um, so, so our metaphor on the mystery creation, I mean, that's been uh, mentioned by a number of journal editors, even for the larger journals. Yep. Uh, and it's cited quite a lot. So, so I don't think yep. if you manage to do this in a very convincing way, yep. th th then uh, there is support for this, but um, it's not so easy to do that, actually. So, uh, But I think that your books do even more than that, because uh, you on one side you help people how to do this well this soft type of research but it also legitimizes this approach 
And that's incredibly important. So when, when someone is at the beginning, they need to be able to refer to something that, okay, there is someone who provided this. It was accepted already in top journals as a valid approach. And this is how I am working on it. I did not just get it from the top of my head without thinking. Yeah, no, and I think that a lot of people have done really interesting stuff in organizations and they are widely admired, like Jim March and, and Carl Weick and, and, and so on. So, so I think that there, is, um, there are a lot of options in academia. It, 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 it could be done in a much, much more interesting way. Um, a bit more risky, a bit more time consuming, a bit more yeah. difficult, but, but still I do think it's worth for most people. I mean, if you feel that you're really weak in a vulnerable situation with supervisors that... Uh... Yeah, thank you very much. Have, have a lost math again. Well, working with data, then it's, we can't say much. I mean, we, uh, I often joke and say that a lot of management and social research is the study of people's questionnaire feeling behavior. And then you can, or, or if you're qualitative, then what people tell you in interview situations. So when you brought, for example, interviews a particular manager at a particular time, then, okay, now we know what the manager said when interviewed by, by, by uh, Ibrat in that, at that moment. But we can't necessarily say that much more about anything else, about minds or intentions or, or the situation or whatever of that particular person. And then if you summarize a lot of other people's statements in the interviews, then yeah, so, so, so that's like rigor. And in some, some uh, cases then we have that in social science. So conversation analysis, very detailed uh, investigations of exactly what people tell in, in, in conversational moments. So that's one extreme. And then the other, you, you use empirical material more as uh, thought triggers, uh, the generation of ideas, etc. And then we normally are something in between here. Um, I do think a lot of so-called rigorous research is very low on vigor that rather peculiar questionnaires are interpreted as indicating so and so. Um, but, but if we are a bit more careful in terms of the interpretive process, that I think that we can, can, can be uh, not generalizing, but be interpretively uh, vigorous and then uh, point at something where we use also imagination. And th that often means that you refrain from very kind of certain statements. This is how it is. But you can say that this empirical material here, it supports certain ways, or it seems reasonable to come up with these ideas, uh, giving the empirical inspiration. And if you do it like that, then I think that you can be quite rigorous in terms of what you're doing, but also imaginative. And this is easy if you have a rich empirical material. Uh, and then because the rich empirical material, it, 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 it can inspire you to say certain things that get, gets reasonably good support from this, this material. Um, and of course, you have issues around cherry picking or generalizations and a lot of other things like that. But still, still, I think we can uh, can do that. And I have done studies of information meetings where we have transcriptions, and then a lot of things can be said based on this material if it's like rich and interesting and inspirational enough. But in most cases, then I think that there's a trade-off between rigor and, and imagination, and sometimes that that uh, trade-off is perhaps done in, in such a way so that it ends up with just this is a case study, I draw this conclusion, not something novel or interesting or imaginative being there. Um, I do think that this is an idea, this is an insight, this is something that we can use to think further about certain issues that can be a good knowledge contribution. And then if we just be less concerned about the kind of video data support, and then we are clear about this is my knowledge claim, not strictly empirical, but something else 
and then you can have the dialogues to other literature, other ideas, and so on. And then, then I think that that's a way of being reasonably rigorous, but also giving space to a lot of imagination. But this is something that we struggle with all the time, I think. Thank you, Matt. Thank you very much, Matt. So, um, I have a question. I wanted to keep my questions till then and give the chance to everyone to ask their questions. Um, so, you know, I, I, I really feel that tension between imagination and rigor. And um, that is something that um, I, I'm kind of experiencing in my work right now because I, I'm, I'm using different, you know, um, aspects from different fields to contribute to my own field. And um, to a paper that I recently submitted to a top journal, we actually got back comments from a reviewer saying that um, the using a metaphor does not necessarily introduce, you know, something, you know, like like new. And specifically, the reviewer um, noted that. Um, it, it didn't convince them that we use the thermodynamics metaphor to study this particular phenomena. And they said that it, using metaphors doesn't always bring refreshing and important insights into theory. And they cite Cornelison. And this is really you know, upsetting because um, I truly believe that for someone who is you know, trying to be interdisciplinary to bring, you know, novel insights into their own field, um, maybe, maybe looked upon as a jack of all trades, you know, and, and not really taken seriously. Um, and um, that's a, something of a struggle that I feel as an early career researcher. Um, you do talk about the costs of the metaphor approach in your book. And I was just wondering, how can we mitigate those costs as early career researchers what is the you know fine line between trying to bring about something that is novel and using you know um, the metaphor approach, but at the same time trying not to anger those who have been accustomed to the established way of you know of the research process? Thank you. Yeah, no, I mean it's it's a, it's a tricky question. Um, uh, the problem with uh, well all contributions is that. Uh, do people see this as kind of new? Is it convincing? Uh, does it work for them? So even if it's new and it's convincing, uh, do they feel that, that they benefit from this? The contribution means that they, they can think more, more cleverly about a particular issue. This is useful for, meta, for managers and so on. So this is all, all the, the judgment that um, people uh, make and they have to make that and, and, and uh, everything that we do is, is quite unpredictable. It's a bit of a lottery because there's so many people with different backgrounds, different criteria, uh, different work situations and so on. With, with metaphors, I think that, I mean, a metaphor needs to function in relationship to an audience and it calls for a particular type of imagination. Uh, and, and, and also um, then uh, being kind of um, formulated or framed in such a way so that it, 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 it really works nicely for a particular audience. And we just need to accept that this is, uh, this is an element of aesthetics uh, also in all this. The beauty with a metaphor is that it is sometimes beautiful that people find this is it's not so dry, not so boring. It it um, it uh, leads to fantasy, imagination. You can see the connection between different stuff. Uh, a good metaphor has some, and the Cornelius has written about this. It has some aesthetic appeal as well, and uh, that. Uh, increases the uh, uncertainty compared to all the stuff where you have all the statistics and techniques and so on. You can perhaps feel that you pull the point, but also there, there's a lot of assessment. Is this kind of good enough? Is this convincing and so on? So I don't think that um, we have any particular uh, suggestions for how to deal with this situation, apart from uh, just try again and, and then work with the text and then consider how does the audience see this? Or from within, this is kind of beautiful and persuasive and near perfection, but other people normally are a bit more skeptical. And uh, it's very tricky and, and disappointing. And as for a young, early career 
research is enormous amount of disappointment because we you work so hard and then there's a hostile uh, world out there we can't do that much about that i, I think that most stuff that we do it, it tend to be rejected and that's the reason why we are so eager to get published in these journals because they reject most of the stuff and, and then we are sometimes on the, the victim side but but uh, in the long run hopefully things are fair and better for us yes indeed thank you so much for your insights it's indeed a struggle and and that's why i'm interested in examining researchers right now as as you know my <laughs> <laughs> my subjects of study to look at what kind of researchers are actually disrupting their field and what kind of teams and their composition, their characteristics, um, how, how are they doing it? So that's what I'm currently interested in and that's what I'm working on. So um, I do feel the struggle and I feel that the research field has, you know, went down the line of um, producing more conventionality. So I want to look at those who are actually going against the stream and how are they doing so? Yeah. Yeah, no, I think that's a, that's an excellent project. So good luck, and we look forward to um, hear or read more about this. Thank you. Thank you.